Hey folks, Colin here from Something's Recording, and today I'm gonna to show you the top three rock mixing mistakes that make your mixes sound amateur. We're gonna be looking at some mixing mistakes today, but before we dive in, if you are ready to go a little bit deeper into the mixing process in its entirety and really start to hone your workflow as an engineer, then I have just the thing for you. It is my seven step mixing checklist and it's just a simple PDF that will walk you through the entire mixing process step by step to help you get professional and radio ready mixes without any more of the hassle and without any more of the guesswork. It is a completely free guide and you can download it below using the link in the video description. Now let's jump in here and talk about these three mixing mistakes. The first one we're gonna discuss is not properly taking care of your low end. And for me, what this means is when I'm looking at my low end, to get it right as easiest and as fast as possible, I want my low end to be coming from as few sources as possible. So in practice, that means using a high pass filter. So if you're not using your high pass filter to get rid of excess low end on like guitars and keyboards and vocals, all that stuff that builds up down there will eventually fight with the low end on your kick drum, the low end on your bass guitar, and anything else that you have down there. If you have any kind of sub information, 808s, stuff like that, low synthesizers, that stuff will get fought with by any kind of residual low end coming from stacked guitars, or stacked vocals. So you wanna use your high pass filter to take care of that. For me in a rock mix like this, the low end is coming from two primary sources. It's coming from the kick drum here, and it's coming from the bass guitar here. But I still have high pass filters, making sure we don't have any heavy sub information that's gonna fight with our fundamental. The fundamental on our kick drum is sitting around this 80 hertz area, or the 70 hertz area. You can see we're boosting the fundamental here uh, on our last EQ. That's where our fundamental is sitting, so we don't need any sub information down here that's gonna fight with that or overshadow that. So we're pulling up our high pass filter here, to make sure we're just focusing on our fundamental. Let me show you what it sounds like if I get rid of this high pass filter. Listen to how our low end gets a little bit looser, gets a little bit more messy sounding. When we kick this in, our low end tightens up, gets a little bit more punchy, and it gets a lot more clean sounding. So we're just focusing in on this kick drum here. I'm gonna pull off this high pass filter. Take a listen to how our sound changes. Without the high pass filter and we get a little bit more ringing down in the low end in that sub area, you can see all that information that's there and it's good to have low end, it's good to have some sub. We're not getting rid of it. All we're doing is we have this roll off here that's reducing it. You can see we're only going down to about negative 12 here is where our slope ends off at zero. So we're just reducing that sub information a little bit. We're not going too aggressive. We're not going 24 dB octave with our slope. Just pulling this 12 dB per octave slope in to reduce a little bit of that sub information and tighten up our low end. So it tightens up our kick a little bit so it's not so long and it's not so exaggerated sounding down there. We don't have that long ringing going on while our kick drum's moving. So that's one way you can use your high pass filter. The other way is getting rid of excess information on your other instruments here. So even if we look at like our snare drum, right? I'm rolling the high pass filter up to 137 here. So we don't get so much of our kick bleed coming in on our snare drum. Like I said, I want the, the low end information to come from as few sources as possible so it stays clean and it stays punchy. It's gonna stay isolated, right? We're only gonna have our kick drum mainly coming from our kick drum. The same thing we want going on with our bass guitar. We only want our bass guitar to be coming from our bass guitar. So if we have amp tracks and stuff, that's usually why I do the frequency split trick where I let my low end come from the bass DI and I have the high end coming from the bass amplifier. Here on the snare drum, we're rolling off here so we don't get so much kick bleed coming in there. We want the kick drum to mainly be coming from the kick drum there. We're not neutering the low end on our snare drum. You can see the fundamental we're boosting on our snare drum is upwards towards this 200 hertz area. So we're rolling off below that to again focus in on the fundamental of that sound. And in practice, all the way across our track here, if we look at our rhythm guitars, again, we're rolling up here to 121 hertz. 
because our bass fundamental is going to be sitting below 100 here. We don't want so much of it coming from our guitars. We want it to come from our bass guitar. That's what we want our bass power to come from, our bass guitar. We don't want it to come from our rhythm guitars, especially because we got a pair here. We got a lead guitar going on as well. All that stuff will stack up over those three guitars. And then you'll have a buildup down here in the 100 hertz area that again will fight with your bass guitar. And again, if we look at our keys here, you can see I'm rolling up to 138 here on the piano. I don't need all that stuff down there below 100. We're getting our, our low end from our bass guitar and our kick drum. Same thing on our organ here. I don't want any low and mid information here fighting with the piano or fighting with the lead vocal or the low end, the fundamental, that 200 hertz area. On our guitar is where we're gonna get weight. I just want the top end here on our organ track. So take a listen here with our organ track and I'm gonna pull off this high pass filter. Listen to the information that comes back on our organ when I get rid of the high pass filter. We don't need any of that, so take a listen. All that stuff down there doesn't help us discern the notes the organ is playing. We want to get some of this 3K area, this 3K, 4K area, that gives you that nice air on the organ, and it gives you some of that swarliness that you're getting from that kind of B3 or Hammond sound. All of this down here in the low end is really just going to fight with our bass guitar and fight with the low end on our guitars. We don't need all of that weight coming from a widespread organ, especially because it's stereo. I don't want all of that 100 hertz building up on the sides of the mix there. That is mixing mistake number one, not properly taking care of your low end and not using a high pass filter to focus your low end on the main sources that are generating it. Number two is fear. So fear can be something that holds you back and it can be something that helps or aids you in making mistakes if, if you wanna say that. But mixing mistake number two is giving in to your fear. And for me, that used to look like being afraid to boost or being afraid to put on um, so much compression. Sometimes you need all that compression. Sometimes compression is a good thing if we layer it on. First example I'm gonna give you here is if we look at this kick drum. So this kick drum was really lacking a lot of punch and a lot of attack up on the top end. It, was, it didn't have that beater attack that I wanted to hear it in the mix and to allow it to cut through so you can hear that top end, that click on the kick drum. Now, back in the day, I would have been afraid of a boost like this. You can see we're all the way up, a 24 dB boost at 8K. That sounds insane. But if I didn't do that, we wouldn't have the kick drum sound that we ended up with. So I'm gonna solve the kick drum here, and I want you to listen. I'm gonna get rid of this 24 dB boost and listen to how our kick drum changes. And then I will, I will slowly bring it back up to 24 dB, and you'll see how this boost here is necessary. It's necessary that this boost is this crazy. So you don't wanna be afraid to boost this much. Boosting can be a good thing, especially if it's necessary. So we'll start with all the way up, and then I will put it back down to zero. Listen to how our kick drum changes, and I'm gonna slowly bring it back up. You'll hear how we get that click back. So here normally is where I would probably start getting a little bit weary of like, eh, I'm boosting a lot here, you know, I'm almost at up at 8 dB, that feels like a lot, maybe I should go and cut more here in the low mid area. Now I could, right, I could go cut more in the low mids, I could shelve the low end a little bit just so we get some of, some of that high end is more prominent, but I don't want to cut low end, I don't want to reduce low end, and there's not low mids that I need to reduce, I just want more high end. So don't be afraid to boost if that's what you want. If you want more high end, pull up the high end. Don't try and go cut low mids or try and reduce the low end because you want to hear more of the top end. Boost what you want. Don't cut other stuff to compensate for that. So let's keep going here, inching towards our, our exaggerated 24 dB boost.
you can hear we really don't start getting that nice click up on the top and that nice attack from our beater until we get up into about 20 dB, 22 dB boost. We don't start hearing that come in to play with the kick drum. Sometimes these boosts are necessary. And if we look at compression, sometimes a lot of compression is necessary too. We're gonna look at our lead vocal here. And I wanna show you that sometimes you're gonna have to do a lot of compression. But here's, here's our first part. So we got a two-parter with fear here. Number one, I don't want you to be afraid to do big boosts like this, okay? Sometimes you need to do that. If you want more top end, do not be afraid to boost the top end. And the same thing goes for our low end. If you want more low end, don't be afraid to boost. Here we got 7 dB at 70 hertz. Don't be afraid to boost that. Now if we go over to our vocal here, got our lead vocal. Let's go to, let's look at our bridge section here for our lead vocal. We're gonna look at this compressor here. This is the, big, the, the main compressor, or actually the only compressor on our lead vocal here. Watch how much compression we're doing here with this 1176 style compressor. We're doing like 10 dB of compression on this vocal. That seems insane, right? But if we solo up our vocal here, I'll get rid of a reverb just so we're focusing on the vocal. Listen to how our vocal changes when I take out this compressor. Well, I'm getting tired of the rain. I can't take another second of pain, oh no. Just make a decision before I go insane. Well, I'm getting tired of the rain. Without the compressor, our vocal feels feels dull. It feels a little, a little more lifeless than it was before. It feels like it lost some energy, lost some life. The compressor is adding aggressiveness. It's adding some grit, as well as doing the job of a compressor of evening out our vocal. By pushing this hard into a compressor, by doing 7 to 10 dB of compression on this vocal, we're adding energy and we're adding life to this vocal. In addition to, you know, leveling out the vocal a little bit so it sits nice and even and up front in this mix, we are getting that extra energy boost and we're getting that extra vibe and that extra character emphasis, oh, excuse me, on our vocal. So I don't want you to be afraid of boosting so much or of layering on the compression because as you've seen in these examples here, it can be a good thing. Now, the third mixing mistake we're gonna cover here today is not making use of analog modeled or analog style plugins. For me, this was really a game changer in taking my mixes from amateur sounding or you know, digital and home studio sounding to more professional sounding. Excuse me. Analog plugins can go a long way into adding depth, into giving your mixes that vibe that make them sound more professional. We're gonna look at two plugins here. One is a free plugin that comes with PreSonus Studio One. That's the console shaper here. The other one we're gonna talk about is a paid plugin. I think this is like $150 is I think I, what, what I spent on it, but it works really well with uh, Studio One. It actually shows up in uh, their mix effects, I think. Um, and this is the the tape machine, it's SoftTube tape machine uh, from SoftTube here. I think it was like $150 when I bought it, but sometimes they run a sale on it. It's like 75 bucks or $100. So, but it's something that really adds a lot of flavor to my mix. And I guess another analog style plugin I use is this, the SSL style bus compressor, the Brit Comp from, also from PreSonus. Um, it comes with Studio One Professional, I think now, or it, actually I think it came with uh, my mixer when I bought my mixer all those years ago, but First one we're gonna look at here is the console shaper. And I'm not using it that aggressively actually. All I have is the drive is flipped on, but you can see our drive's actually all the way down at zero here. I'm not pushing into this drive, just running my mix through this console plugin to get a little bit of that console vibe. And it's gonna add a little bit of depth to our mix here. So take a listen, and I'm gonna turn it off, listen to how our entire mix changes here.
it's a subtle difference, but to me, even at this zero, even all with the drive all the way down at zero, it's the difference between just listening to a bunch of different tracks pulled up and kind of playing at the same time. And then when you kick it in, all of these tracks seem to work together to make a song. That's what this console shaper does. It kind of blends everything together and helps the, every, all these different tracks work as a cohesive song and a cohesive mix. That's what I get from this console shaper. So if you don't have uh, Studio One, you don't have the console shaper, I believe Waves makes their NS console. I can't remember what that's called. And then of course there's the virtual console collection from uh, Slate Digital, which is a pretty popular plugin as well for getting some console emulation. Those kind of things go a long way to making your mixes feel deeper and not just you know right to left, they feel front to back feels like everything's working together. That's what you get from running through an analog console, that analog console vibe. But this one here, this tape machine plugin, goes a long way in getting my low end right. It adds a little bit of depth that gives you that, you know, that tape vibe. But using this tape machine on the B setting here at uh, 30 IPS, the 30, 30 IPS tape speed, really helps me get my low end right. So pay attention to our kick drum, Ooh, excuse me, and our bass guitar. Uh, with this tape machine. So I will start with it in and then I will bypass it. Listen to our kick drum, listen to our bass guitar with it. Hear the depth and the energy it adds to the bottom end of the mix? That for me is what I get from, from a tape machine, from whatever you wanna call it, tape compression or pushing into a tape emulation plugin like this. It really does wonders for your low end. So if you don't have a tape machine like this, and you can see I'm, I'm sitting usually between uh, the three and the five here on the VU meter. If you don't have a tape machine plugin, if you don't have the soft tube one, um, Slate Digital makes a really great one. And I used to use uh, the Kramer tape from uh, Waves. Waves Kramer tape is really, really good. And I believe they have an Abbey Road one as well. I think it's their Abbey Road tape machine. I can't remember what that one was called, but the Kramer tape or the Slate Digital tape machine will do wonders for your mix and giving it some depth, giving it some tape vibe. So that analog vibe, as well as helping you get your low end right. You can hear when I clicked it in, our kick drum bloomed and our bass guitar bloomed to fill out our low end. Without this in, our low end felt small, it felt compact, it didn't have power, and it lacked the weight to fill out our mix. So these two plugins here, the console shaper and the tape machine, really do a lot for me to get my mixes right, to help them sound powerful and to help them sound big and wide. It gives you that front, front to back depth, right? So you have your right to left, and then you have your front to rear depth as well. That helps your mix sound balanced, and it helps it sound full, not just you know left to right, but front to back as well. So those are the top three rock mixing mistakes that will make your mixes sound amateur. So if you're not taking proper care of your low end, you're not using a high pass filter to get rid of any kind of residual low end that builds up on guitars or vocal stacks, that kind of stuff will hurt your low end. Number two is mixing with fear. So if you're afraid to boost top end, you're afraid to boost too much low end, or you're afraid to use too much compression. Sometimes you need that compression. Sometimes you're not just going to you know, balance the vocal volume wise. Sometimes you're going for character and sometimes you're going for vibe. So keep that stuff in mind when you're using EQ and compression. If it sounds good, it is good. Number three is not making use of analog modeled plugins. You can get a great mix with you know the stock digital plugins in your DAW, but putting in, sprinkling in some analog style plugins, whether it's a tape machine or some console emulation, will go a long way to making your mix sound professional and polished. I hope that was helpful for you today. As I mentioned at the beginning of the video, if you are ready to take your mixes to the next level and really start dialing in your workflow as an engineer, then I have just the tool for you and it is completely free. It is my seven-step mixing checklist 
and you can download it below to start creating more professional mixes in less time. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next video. Thank <laughs> you.